we can gather in to worship you and to study your word. And we just pray tonight, Lord, that you pour your spirit upon us. We pray that you help us to learn the things uh, here in Genesis that we're going to read through tonight. Pray for those that are uh, listening on the radio, the internet, Lord, and those that are here. Bless us and encourage us, Lord. And as always, we want to worship you from our hearts. We love you so much, Lord. And these songs that we're going to sing on to you tonight, may they honor you and bless you. We ask this in Jesus' name. Amen. This evening, if you would, please turn in your Bibles to Genesis chapter 31 as we continue our study through the Word of God. And keep in mind that in our last study, we saw that 11 sons were born to Jacob from Leah, Rachel, and their maidservants, Bilhah and Zilpah. And we're told in Genesis 30, verses 25 and 26, that <clears throat> it came to pass when Rachel had born Joseph, that Jacob said to Laban, Send me away, that I may go to my own place and to my own country. Give me my wives and my children for whom I have served you, and let me go, for you know my service which I have done for you. So to kind of get things in order here, after Joseph was born, Jacob felt the call of God upon his life to return to the land of Canaan. Think about it. He worked for his uncle Laban in Haran for 14 years now. And Jacob recognized, this is not my home. And the only problem is Laban doesn't want Jacob to leave. And, you know, there's a lot of reasons we could think of why Laban wanted Jacob to stay, but it wasn't for the daughters of Laban. It wasn't for his grandchildren. It was basically because he wanted the blessings that Jacob had given to him. He was benefiting from these blessings of Jacob. He was kind of like a cash cow to Laban. So Jacob says, you know what, I'm going to make a deal with you. I'll stay with you for a time, and when it's time for me to leave, all the speckled and spotted sheep and goats would be his, and the solid colored ones would belong to Laban. And Laban thinks, you know, this is a good deal because the dominant gene in these animals would be solid, solid colored ones, and it would favor him. But in case there was a problem, and God blesses Jacob. Laban's a very interesting guy. He put Jacob in charge of his own animals. So if God blesses Jacob, then he would be blessing Laban. He also put Jacob's flocks under the charge of Laban's sons, so they wouldn't be blessed. But even with that, we're told in Genesis 30, verse 43, Thus the man, Jacob, became exceedingly prosperous and had large flocks, female and male servants, and camels and donkeys. Now, as we move into chapter 31 of Genesis, Jacob has been working for Laban for another six years, 20 years in all. And again, now he feels it's time to go home. This is not his home. He wants to go back to the land of Canaan the land that God had promised to them. So with that as our background, let's pick up Genesis chapter 31, starting in verse 1, and let's see what the Lord has for us this evening as we study his word. Now Jacob heard the words of Laban's son, saying, Jacob has taken away all that was our father's, and from what was our father's, he has acquired all this wealth. And Jacob saw the countenance of Laban, and indeed it was not favorable toward him as before. You know, why are Laban's sons so upset with Jacob? It's not Jacob stole anything, but Jacob was gaining more and more, and Laban was losing more and more. And because of that, these guys are like, hey, that's our inheritance. Dad dies, we're going to get lost. We got to do something about this guy, Jacob. He's taken our inheritance away. And yes, God was blessing Jacob. And obviously, they didn't like it. And think about it. When Laban, when this deal was made, he thought it was a great deal. Now, not so much. And envy is a dangerous sin to deal with. Now, we don't have to deal with that anymore, do we? This thing called envy. Well, of course we do. It was a problem back then. It's a problem today. It was a problem in Paul's day. In 1 Corinthians 3, verse 3, Paul wrote about what was happening in the church in Corinth said, for you are still carnal. For where there are envy, strife, and divisions among you, are you not carnal and behaving like mere men? So it was a problem in Paul's day, just as it is in our day. James wrote in James 3.16, 
For where envy and self-seeking exist, confusion and every evil thing are there. Yeah. You know, <clears throat> look at what we're seeing here in Genesis. The mess that's happening, the confusion that this envy brought about. It brought about all this bitterness in the hearts of Laban's sons and in Laban's heart as well. You know, Ecclesiastes 4.4, 4, Solomon said, Again, I saw that for all toil and every skillful work, a man is envied by his neighbor. There also is vanity in grasping for the wind. You know, in other words, you work really hard and everyone wants what you have. It's kind of like today, you know, in America. Everyone wants what you have, but they don't want to work for it. Now, Solomon in Ecclesiastes is looking at this from a human perspective. You know, he said in, in the opening verses of Ecclesiastes chapter 1, Vanities of vanity, says the preacher. Vanities of vanities, all is vanity. What profit has a man from all his labor in which he toils under the sun? And that's the key phrase, under the sun. His perspective was not of God. It was under the sun. It was looking at from a human perspective. And he says everything that he does is in vain. No matter what he tries is empty. It's like grasping the wind. He's not attaining what he wants. But here's the thing. Because he had that worldly perspective, he lost focus. But Paul reminds us in 1 Corinthians 15, 58, Therefore, my beloved brethren, be steadfast and movable, always abounding in the work of the Lord, knowing that your labor, your toil, is not in vain in the Lord. There's the key. What we do is not in vain. Do we always see the results of what we do? No. And we may never see them on this side of eternity. But working for God is not in vain. You know, there are blessings as we serve the Lord, as we work out our faith. So we work hard in spite of what others may say or do to us. You know, that's what Paul said in Colossians 3.17. Whatever you do in word or deed, do all in the name of the Lord Jesus, giving thanks to God the Father through him. You know, as we serve him, we bring glory to him. And for Jacob, he worked hard those 20 years. He didn't, you know, slack off. And God was blessing him. And, you know, I think what God is doing here in chapter 31 of Genesis is stirring the nest a little bit. Why? To get Jacob to fly away, to go back home. Now there's all this trouble, right? He's been there 20 years. The sons of Laban are upset. Laban's upset because he's, they're losing their herds. Jacob's gaining, they're losing. And so you want, Jacob is going to want to head back home. And when you look at the circumstances, they seem to point in that direction. But again, circumstances can fool us. But look at how Jacob knew it was time to leave. Look at verse 3 here in Genesis 31. Then the Lord said to Jacob, Return to the land of your fathers and to your kindred, and I will be with you. So for those 20 years that Jacob was serving Laban, did Jacob know that God was preparing for this time for him to return home. I don't think so. But God gave him a desire to go home back in Genesis 30, verse 25. And now the situation changed. Things got a little uneasy here with Laban and his sons. They were very angry at Jacob and because God was blessing him. And God said, hey, you know what, Jacob? It's time to go. You know, Here's the, the thing that we have to remember. Jacob just didn't leave because things got bad. Things got tough. And that's what happens with a lot of Christians. Oh, it's too hard. This must not be of God. I'm going to stop. No. I mean, if you look at the New Testament, and you look at what you know, Paul and these other disciples of Christ went through, it was always hard. You know, Paul goes to the synagogues at first. What? They, th they throw him out, basically. He gets stoned in, I think it's Lystra. And what does he do? He's left for dead in the streets. His brethren come to him and he gets up, right? 
And he goes back into the city where they stoned him. Why? Because he's, they got to hear the gospel of Jesus Christ. You know, how do we know what God wants us to do? I mean, that's a tough question sometimes, right? First of all, Jacob left because God's word told him to leave. Return to the land of your fathers. God's spirit, I'll be with you. They lined up. Circumstances, God's word, the spirit. You know, there's a harbor in Italy, and this is probably from years ago. I'm not sure if they still use it this way. But this har harbor could only be reached by sailing up this narrow channel and it had dangerous rocks and reefs on either side. And many ships were wrecked because of it, and so they had to figure out a way to navigate through this dangerous passage. And they came up with this great idea. They put up three lights on huge poles in the harbor. And go, well, how does that help? When these three lights are perfectly lined up and seen as one, the ship can proceed forward. They can make it to port safely. If the pilot sees two or three lights, he knows, I'm off course, I'm in trouble. i got to readjust to be safe. And God's given us three lights or beacons to guide us. And if these three beacons line up as one, I think we're safe to proceed. We can go forward. And if not, then don't do it. The Word of God is the objective standard. You know, is what you're doing in accordance to what God's Word has to say. The Holy Spirit, the subject of witness, is God spoken to your heart. And again, when God speaks to your heart by his Spirit, it's not going to contradict his Word. Not at all. And then the circumstances, the divine providence. You know, the story to bring me up here from Chicago to Wisconsin, those all fell in. God spoke to me and said he was going to bring me to Wisconsin one day. But he never told me when. And he never told me how he was going to do it. And, you know, I waited. And in God's timing, he opened the door and brought me up here. You know, that's what we need to do, guys. Sometimes it's hard to wait. That was 12, 11, 12 years of waiting for God to move me after he called me. But boy, and is it always that long? No. But just wait upon God, and he'll lead us, just as he's doing here with Jacob. Look at verse 4. So Jacob sent and called Rachel and Leah to the field to his flock. And said to them, I see your father's countenance that is not favorable toward me as before. But the God of my father has been with me. And you know that with all my might I have served your father. Yet your father has deceived me and changed my wages ten times. But God did not allow him to hurt me. If he said thus, the speckled shall be your wages, then all the flocks bore speckled. And if he said thus, the streaked shall be your wages, then all the flocks bore streaked. So God has taken away the livestock of your father and given them to me. And it happened at the time when the flocks conceived that I lifted my eyes and saw in a dream, and behold, the rams which leaped upon the flocks were streaked, speckled, and gray spotted. Then the angel of God spoke to me in a dream, saying, Jacob, and I said, Here I am. And he said, Lift your eyes now and see. All the rams which leap on, your, on the flocks are streaked, speckled, and gray spotted. For I have seen all that Laban is doing to you. I am the God of Bethel, where you anointed the pillar and where you made a vow to me. Now arise, get out of this land, and return to the land of your kindred. Then Rachel and Leah answered, well, let me stop here in verse 13 for a second. As God spoke to Jacob, what does he do? He gathers Rachel and Leah together, his wives, and he tells them, look, this is what God has told me. We've we got to leave. This is what we need to do as a family. And he calls them out into the field. I think he doesn't want them in the house or anywhere where Laban or any servants could hear and tell Laban that they're going to be leaving. And I like the fact that Jacob is the spiritual leader of the family. And I also like the fact that Rachel and Leah are aware of his work ethics, that he worked very hard. He was trustworthy, faithful, 
And they understood how their father Laban treated and cheated Jacob. Ten times he changed his wages. And I don't think it was over the full 20 years. I think it was those last six years. Because remember the first 14 years he was working for his wives. Those seven years for Leah and seven years for Rachel. So I think these last six years, when God is blessing Laban and increasing his flock, I think Laban keeps changing his wages, and he did it ten times. But God saw it and dealt with it. You know, again, there are people that will try to cheat us and rip us off. Make no mistake about it, God is totally aware, and he takes care of our things. You know, in Psalm 118, verses 6 through 9, we're told, The Lord is on my side. I will not fear. What can man do to me? The Lord is for me among those who help me. Therefore, I shall see my desire on those who hate me. It is better to trust in the Lord than to put confidence in man. It is better to trust in the Lord than to put confidence in princes. I've seen this in my own life. You know, many years ago when I was back in Chicago, I played, applied for a, a nursing supervisor position, which would be over the intensive care unit, the cardiac care unit, the emergency room, surgery, the telemetry unit. And I was in my early 20s. I mean, I was a young whippersnapper, not like I am now. And it required a bachelor's degree. I didn't have a bachelor's degree. I had an associate degree in nursing. But I applied anyway. I kind of felt through various situations and circumstances that the Lord was leading me into this position. And I applied for it, and I got the job, and I got this huge pay increase. And it was great. But one day, the evening and night supervisors went into the vice president of nursing's office and opened her file cabinet that had all the files of the employees and pulled my file out to see what I was getting paid. And when they saw what I was getting paid, they were very upset. And they told the vice president of nursing that they weren't happy that I was getting paid that much. Now, here's the thing. That is totally illegal. You can't do that. The vice president of nursing should have just fired them immediately. But that didn't happen. What happened was they ended up decreasing my pay. Now, I could have been very upset about it. I could have made a big stink about it. But I didn't. And what the Lord was showing me is, like, you got a position that you weren't even qualified for. You didn't have the bachelor degree to have this position. You had an associate degree. But I allowed you to have this to teach you some lessons, administrative lessons, you might say. And so I just took the pay decrease. And my pay was still very good, but God was moving me, stirring the nest, you might say, preparing me for the next step to move on. Even up here in Wisconsin, the same thing happened to me. They didn't look at my files and get mad, but a new boss came on and saw what I was getting paid and didn't like it and decreased my pay again. And it was just another God stirring the nest to get me to move forward and actually to be on full time here instead of working the two positions. And, you know, it's like David said in Psalm 27, 1, The Lord is my light and my salvation. Whom shall I fear? The Lord is the strength of my life. Of whom shall I be afraid? And there's the key. Do people take advantage of us? Absolutely they do. Did people take care? Did Laban and his sons take advantage of Jacob? Absolutely they did. Big time. But Jacob worked hard. He served faithfully. And God blessed him abundantly in spite of what they tried to do. Because God's in control. What can man really do to us? And, you know, back in Genesis 31, 3, the Lord speaking to him was kind of the basics. But here in Genesis uh, 31, 10 through 13, he's kind of expounding on more of the details that God had shown him. He needs to go back to Bethel, back to the house of God, Back to the place he first had that encounter with God. Why? Well, because it's important to go to that place where God is speaking to you. And that was Bethel. You know, 
Jacob is, I don't think we understand as we read these stories sometimes, what Jacob was going to be doing. He's moving his wives, his 11 children, his flocks and herds 500 miles. And there's always Laban. And who's back home? Oh, his brother Esau, who he fled from 20 years earlier. So there's a lot of opposition, right? But he's going to have to trust God. Or a call to go home to the promised land, the land of Canaan. And he's preparing his journey. Look at verse 14. Then Rachel and Leah answered and said to him, Is there still any portion or inheritance for us in our father's house? Are we not considered strangers by him? For he has sold us and also completely consumed our money. For all these riches which God has taken from our father are really ours and our children's now. Now then, whatever God has said to you, do it. Did Rachel and Leah get along? Well, no, we've seen that they didn't. But here they are, right? They're in agreement that their dad Laban was not interested in them, really didn't care about them. He was in, concerned about the dowry, and he spent it all. And they saw all the wealth that Jacob obtained as kind of a retribution for what their father did to them. Dad doesn't care about us. There's nothing here anymore for us. If you are called to go home, Jacob, we're coming with you. There were no ties. So they're going to go to the place that God had called them to go to. I think Henry Morris gives us insight into this. He said, Rachel and Leah revealed in their words that they had long resented the way their father had essentially sold them to Jacob. He had treated them as strangers or foreigners rather than as his own daughters. Their exorbitant price, which Jacob had paid for them, 14 years of free service to Laban, made them love Jacob but resent their father. Rather than treating this payment like a dowry to provide a financial base for his daughter's future well-being and security, as should have been done, he had devoured it all himself, using it probably to build up his own holdings and had given nothing to them personally. They rightly felt that since their husband had been responsible for the great prosperity of their father, and since this was in effect what Jacob had given in order to marry them, these possessions by all rights should have come to them. You know, think about the task that Jacob was placing again upon himself and the trust that Rachel and Leah had in Jacob providing for them on this journey. It was a huge one. Like I said, 500 miles, all this, the children, the livestock, the servants. And I love what they said to Jacob. This is just trust. Whatever God said to you, do it. Go for it. One writer said, those that are really their husband's helpmates will never be their hindrances in doing that to which God calls them. Yeah. Now, I've been blessed with a beautiful helpmate, my wife. You know, when we moved up to Chicago, from Chicago, now she had to leave everything, all her friends. And moved to a place where she knew absolutely nobody. But without hesitation, she basically said what Rachel and Leah said when I told her, you know, I think God has called me to Manitowoc. And she basically said, whatever God has said to you, do it. What a blessing to have a wife who is supportive of the work that God has called me to do and now is supportive in the work. And is it always easy? No. My wife is, she says, I'm always watching over you, Joe. Oh, thanks. I love that about my wife because she knows that I would go 24-7, but she says she always reminds me, you need to take a rest here. We need to take some time to get away. And I think that's really good. You need a helpmate like that. And Jacob was blessed to have a support of his family as they embark on this really venture of faith. Look at verse 17. Then Jacob rose and set his sons and his wives on camels and carried away all his livestock and all his possessions which he had gained 
his acquired livestock, which he gained in Padan Aram, to go to his father Isaac in the land of Canaan. Now Laban had gone to shear his sheep, and Rachel had stolen the household idols or the teraphim that were her father's. And Jacob stole away, unknown to Laban, the Syrian. And in that he did not tell him that he intended to flee. So he fled with all that he had. He arose and crossed the river and headed toward the mountains of Gilead. And Laban was, or let me stop there. I could just go reading on this story. Jacob was unsure how Laban would respond to this, right? I mean, he spent six more years working. So he leaves without telling Laban. And I think Laban, if he wanted to, could have taken possession of Jacob, Laban's daughters, and the children from Jacob. Jacob didn't have any power to do anything about it. Now, was Jacob right in doing it this way? I don't think so. Why? What did the Lord say to Jacob at Bethel in Genesis 28, 15? Behold, I am with you and will keep you wherever you go and will bring you back to this land, for I will not leave you until I have done what I have spoken to you. Well, isn't that interesting? God said, <coughs> I'm going to bring you back to this land of Canaan. I'm not going to leave you. Don't worry about it. I think he's a little worried. <laughs> okay? And even in this chapter, God tells him to return home. So do you think he's going to make it? Absolutely. God's, the work he started in Jacob, he's going to finish. You know, Bonhaus explains or expounds on it this way. He could have announced his departure and gone in the glory of an army with banners, but fear made it impossible to reap the full measure of blessing. He sneaked away into the will of God instead of departing in triumph. Yeah. Also, we're told that Rachel stole the household idols or the teraphim. Why did she do that? Well, some feel to kind of get back at her father by taking these household protection, you might say, these gods, um, possible. Maybe the teraphim, it's also possible, represented the deed to the inheritance. It's very possible. Um, we see that in the Nuzi tablets of the 15th century B.C. And <coughs> if that's true, none of her brothers would be able to take any of the possession. But no matter what, these are false idols, not the true and living God. Now, think about this. Being married to Jacob, she had far more than Laban will ever have. She didn't see it that way. She actually longed for less. Jacob had all this, but she wanted less by taking these idols. <clears throat> but don't we do that? Don't we have everything we need from God, every spiritual blessing in the heavenly places in Christ? And we long for less. We long for what the world has. Does the world look satisfied? No, there's always something new. There's always something bigger, brighter, whatever. They're never satisfied. And I think that's what Jake, Rachel is doing here. Since her dad had used up all her dowry. And here's Jacob. He heads out. He's in the mountains of Gilead, some 300 miles from Haran. A really tough journey. He's leaving this place of safety, in a sense, to uncertainty. Remember when he left home, like I said, Esau wanted to kill him because he took the inheritance, which God had already given to Jacob, but being the secondborn, not the firstborn, Jacob thought he needed to steal it. He didn't. He doesn't know how, what Esau's feeling right now. And so he doesn't know what's ahead of him on this journey. And all Jacob has to go on was the word of God opened up to him by the Spirit of God and the circumstances he faced to go on. Right now, it's enough. And that's pretty much what we have. The word of God opened up to us by the Spirit of God to lead us where we need to go, what we need to do. Look at verse 22. And Laban was told on the third day that Jacob had fled. 
Then he took his brethren with him and pursued him for seven days' journey, and he overtook him in the mountains of Gilead. But God had come to Laban the Syrian in a dream by night and said to him, Be careful that you speak to Jacob neither good nor bad. How did Laban not know that Jacob left for three days? I think because they lived far apart. Laban was shearing the sheep. They were out in the fields. And again, they were separated. So Jacob has a three-day head start, and Laban is not a happy man. And he's in hot pursuit of Jacob. He catches him within seven days in the mountains of Gilead. And again, that's not such a great feat, considering Jacob was traveling with this massive caravan. Laban wasn't. He didn't have all these flocks and herds and children and wives and stuff. So he can go much faster. But it's interesting. Who spoke to Laban before he reached Jacob? God did. And what did he say? Uh, Hands off, son. Don't touch him. And really be careful what you say to him. Ow, right? I think Laban understood that very clearly. Laban's not a believer. God got his attention. Look at verse 25. So Laban overtook Jacob. Now Jacob had pitched his tent in the mountains, and Laban with his brethren pitched in the mountains of Gilead. And Laban said to Jacob, What have you done that you have stolen away unknown to me and carried away my daughters like captives taken with the sword? Why did you flee away secretly and steal away from me and not tell me? For I might have sent you away with joy and songs, with timbrel and harp. And you did not allow me to kiss my sons and my daughters. Now you have done foolishly in so doing. It is in my power to do you harm. But the God of your father spoke to me last night, saying, Be careful that you speak to Jacob neither good nor bad. So Laban's trying to make Jacob feel bad, right? Well, why'd you go? I didn't get to kiss my daughters and my grandchildren. I would have had a party. We would have had a celebration. It would have been great. Give me a break. He wasn't going to do that. You know, He then tries to intimidate Jacob because the other thing didn't work. Jacob knew Laban very well. He said, look, I could have made mincemeat out of you if I wanted, but God stopped me. You're really lucky. I don't know. I I think if we could have seen the face of Jacob, I wonder if there was a little snicker on his face. Could have been. Look at verse 30. And now you have surely gone because you greatly long for your father's house. But why did you steal my gods? Then Jacob answered and said to Laban, Because I was afraid, for I said, Perhaps you would take your daughters from me by force. With whomever you find your gods, do not let him live. In the presence of our brethren, identify what I have of yours and take it with you. For Jacob did not know that Rachel had stolen them. And Laban went into Jacob's tent, into Leah's tent, and into the two maids' tents, but he did not find them. Then he went out of Leah's tent and entered Rachel's tent. Now Rachel had taken the household idols, put them in a camel's saddle, and sat on them. And Laban searched all about the tent, but did not find them. And she said to her father, Let it not not displease my Lord that I cannot rise before you, for the manner of woman is with me. And he searched, but he did not find the household idols. So Jacob says, look, you know, Laban, the reason I left is I was afraid, you know, that you would take your daughters back. They are my wives. I wanted them. And then Laban says, you know, someone stole my gods. Does that make you laugh at all? If someone can steal your god, then really how big is your god? You know, remember years ago, up in Green Bay, someone had lo- they had stolen the statue of the saint who's the saint of lost things. And this saint was now lost, which is really funny to me. Um, but they did find it. I don't think that's going to help them any. 
But think about it. What kind of God are you worshiping if it could be stolen? And Jacob's like, well, you know what, dude? Check for yourself. I don't think he said dude. But he said, check for yourself. Check it out, man. And if anyone has stolen your God or stolen anything from you, you kill him. You just put a death sentence on Rachel, right? And Rachel, I guess she learned from her father pretty well. She said, Dad, I can't get up. I'm, you know, it's that time of the month. So I'm just going to sit here. And she's sitting on the idol that's in the saddlebag. So she deceives her father. So Laban can't find this God that he lost. And as we read on, we're going to see that this is the last straw for Jacob. He's pretty much had it with Laban. He's going to blow a gasket here. Look at verse 36 here in Genesis 31. Then Jacob was angry and rebuked Laban. And Jacob answered and said to Laban, What is my trespass? What is my sin that you have so hotly pursued me? Although you have searched all my things, what part of your household things have you found? Set it here before my brethren and your brethren, that they may judge between us both. These twenty years I have been with you. Your ewes and your female goats have not miscarried their young, and I have not eaten the rams of your flock. That which was torn by beast I did not bring to you. I bore the loss of it. You required it from my hand, whether stolen by day or stolen by night. There I was in the day the drought consumed me, and the frost by night, and my sleep departed from my eyes. Thus I have been in your house twenty years. I served you fourteen years for your two daughters, and six years for your flock, and you have changed my wages ten times. Unless the God of my father, the God of Abraham, and the fear of Isaac had been with me, surely now you would have sent me away empty-handed. God has seen my affliction and the labor of my hands and rebuked you last night. So Jacob has pretty much had it. He's not going to let Laban get away with this anymore. And he knew that Laban came to steal from him, but it, God intervened and took care of it. You know, Jacob's tired. 20 years of this garbage. And he kind of lets him have it. And Really, Laban didn't have anything against Jacob. He served him faithfully 20 years. He didn't take advantage of Laban's flocks. He cared for them. When a wild beast killed one of the animals Jacob, that Jacob was watching, he bore the loss. And really what would happen is if a wild animal like, took a sheep, if you could bring back part of that sheep to the owner and say, hey, look, you know, I tried, but a wild beast got it then you weren't responsible for it. Jacob said, you know what? Look, I bore the loss of that. I mean, this guy is a great worker here. He bore the loss. He took his job seriously. And, you know, again, I look at shepherds today, pastors, watching over the flock that God has entrusted to them. It is such a battle today. I don't think people realize it. Paul, in Acts 20, verses 26 through 32, he was encouraging and warning the Ephesian elders, the pastors. He said to them, Therefore I testify you this day that I am innocent of the blood of all men, for I have not shunned to declare to you the whole counsel of God. In other words, I've taught you everything you need to know. I've taught you the word of God. He says, therefore, take heed to yourself and to all the flock among which the Holy Spirit has made you overseers, to shepherd the church of God which he purchased with his own blood. You take care of the people that God has entrusted to you. Why? He says, for I know this, that after my departure, savage wolves will come in among you, not sparing the flock. Also from among yourselves, men will rise up, speaking perverse things, to draw away the disciples, the disciples after themselves. Therefore, watch and remember that for three years I did not cease to warn everyone night and day with tears. So now, brethren, I commend you to God and to the word of his grace, which is able to build you up and give you an inheritance among all those who are sanctified. Paul said, be careful. 
savage wolves are going to come in to try and destroy the sheep with their false teaching. Even from within the church, people will rise up with false teaching. Why? To destroy the sheep. You are the shepherd of the church. You need to watch over them and protect them and warn them of the dangers that are out there. And the way you do that is by feeding them the nourishment of God's word. All scripture is given by inspiration of God and it is profitable for what? For doctrine, for reproof, for correction, for instruction in righteousness that the man of God may be complete, thoroughly equipped for every good work. It's kind of like our immune system. Think of the word of God that way. False teachings coming, here comes the immune system on because we know the word of God and it exposes the false teaching. Yeah, that's exactly what we need. What's going to happen, though, in the last days, in the days we're living in? Well, after Paul talked about the Word of God being so important in our lives, profitable, he said in, in 2 Corinthians 4, starting in verse 2, I charge you, therefore, before God and the Lord Jesus Christ, who will judge the living and the dead at his appearing and in his kingdom. Preach the Word. Be ready in season and out of season. Convince, rebuke, exhort with all long suffering and teaching. Why is that so important? He says, because the time's going to come when they're not going to endure sound doctrine. But according to their own desires, because they have itching ears, they will heap up for themselves teachers and they will turn their ears away from the truth and be turned aside to fables. But you be watchful in all things, endure afflictions, do the work of an evangelist, fulfill your ministry. We need to be praying for pastors who are faithfully teaching the Word of God because it is a battle out there. The, and in some denominations, the battle is so intense because there is such pressure to grow a church that if they're not doing that, then all of a sudden they're going to be removed. But what about God? It, you know, in Acts, it talks about God adding to the church daily. Let God do his job. You preach the word in season and out of season. Convince, rebuke, exhort with all long-suffering and teaching. Don't stop. Continue in the work. And so we need to pray. Now, Jacob has just blasted Laban, right? How's Laban going to respond? Well, look at verse 43. He says, And Laban answered and said to Jacob, these daughters are my daughters, and these children are my children, and this flock is my flock, and all that you see is mine. But what can I say? What can I do this day to these my daughters or to their children whom they have born? Now therefore come, let us make a covenant, you and I, and let it be a witness between you and me. So Jacob took a stone and set it up as a pillar. Then Jacob said to his brethren, Gather stones. And they took, the, took stones and made a heap, and they ate there on the heap. Laban called it Yeager Sedutha, but Jacob called it Galid. And Laban said, This heap is a witness between you and me this day. Therefore, it is na its name will be called Galid. Also Mizpah, because he said, May the Lord watch between you and me when we are absent from one another. If you afflict my daughters, or if you take other wives beside my daughters, although no man is with us, see, God is witness between you and me. So it's interesting. Laban says, look, Jacob, all that you have is really mine. Was that true? No. He worked 14 years for his two daughters. He worked another seven years for all these animals. So that wasn't really true. But he's basically saying, look, out of the kindness of my heart, I've given them to you. Oh, what a guy, you know? Uh, sounds good, but it wasn't true. And thank God that God spoke to Laban and said, don't touch this man. Don't speak good or bad to him. Don't touch him at all. And Jacob and Laban make a covenant and set up boundary stones, and they call the place Galid. This heap is a witness between you and me this day. In other words, if you cross over this line that's drawn in the sand, these stones, I'm going to kill you. You kind of feel the love there, right? And Mizpah, 
May the Lord watch between you and me when we're absent from one another. If you flick my daughters or if you take other wives beside my daughters, although no man is with us, see, God is witness between you and me. Now, if you do something to my daughters, God is going to get you. Now, it's several years ago, the merchandise, Christian merchandising world had these little lockets. They called them the Mizpah. And there were two of them broken in half. And it was taken out of here. And it was supposed to be just a wonderful thing, you know, the love between two people. Basically what it was saying, if you do something wrong, I'm going to kill you. It wasn't really good. And when people finally realized, and they, I'm sure they sold many of them because people don't know what the Word of God has to say, but uh, it went off the market. Now, Look at what happens next. Look at verse 51. Then Laban said to Jacob, Here is this heap and here is this pillar, which I have placed between you and me. This heap is a witness, and this pillar is a witness, that it will not pass beyond this heap to you. And you will not pass beyond this heap and this pillar to me for harm. The God of Abraham, the God of Nahor, and the God of their father uh, judge between us. And Jacob swore by the fear of his father Isaac, then Jacob offered a sacrifice on the mountain and called his brethren to eat bread. Um, and they ate bread and stayed all night on the mountain. And early in the morning, Laban rose and kissed his sons and his daughters and blessed them. Then Laban departed and returned to his place. Now, this is not talking about, as some try to make it, separation um, from the in-laws here. You know, they use Genesis 2.24, man shall leave his father and mother and be joined to his wife. They shall become one flesh. Yeah, that's talking about it, that you know, a, new, a new family has started. But that's not what's being said here. The point I think that's being made in these verses is Laban was a man of the world, right? And Jacob needed to separate from the world, and he does. To separate from the gods of this world, and to do that, We'll see in Genesis chapter 35, in a few weeks, he gets back to Bethel. Now, Boyce put it like this. He said, this is the last we hear of Laban in the Bible. And it is good that this is the end of him. Laban is of the world. Jacob needed to be freed from this world in order to, be wholeheart to live wholeheartedly for the God of his fathers. You know, Laban could have turned to the true and living God. Jacob was there for 20 years witnessing. But he didn't. He wanted the blessings and benefits of, from God, but he didn't want the God who gives those blessings. And that's many do that today. They want, oh, bless me, bless me, but they don't want that relationship with God. It's not how it works. And, you know, for Jacob, yeah, was this an easy journey? No. But he was willing to walk by faith and trust in God. But like us, there's that, the struggles, right? We're doing good, we're doing good, and then there's a, some things that happen in our lives. And it's like, oh, we, we're losing our faith again. We're not trusting like we did. Look at chapter 32, verse 1. So Jacob went on his way, and the angels of God met him. And when Jacob saw them, he said, this is God's camp. And he called the name of that place Mahanaim. So Jacob was... Fearful of, of Laban, now he's fearful of his encounter with his brother Esau. And God says, you know, don't fear Jacob. I have my angels in camp with you. And thus Jacob calls the place Mahanaim, or double camp. You see, not only was Jacob and his group there, but so were the angels of God. Two camps, and they're to watch over, protect Jacob and his family. And what encouragement that should have given to Jacob. Not only did the Lord tell Jacob he would return home, now he's saying, look, angels are watching over you. Wow. And what was true in Jacob's day, I think is true in our day as well. Paul in Hebrews 1.14 tells us, are they not all ministering spirits, speaking of angels, sent forth to minister for those who will inherit salvation? Yeah, he's speaking about us. God, God's angels are watching over our lives. Some of them have bigger jobs than others, but yeah, the angels are watching over us. I like that. 
Now, how is this going to change Jacob's perspective of meeting his brother Esau? 20 years earlier, he wanted to kill him. This should have given him great confidence to forge ahead. God's in control. God said, I'm going back home. These angels are watching over me and my family. Should have given him great encouragement, but let's read on and see. Verse 3. Then Jacob sent messengers before him to Esau, his brother, in the land of Seir, the country of Edom. And he commanded them, saying, Speak thus to my lord Esau. Thus your servant Jacob says, I have sojourned with Laban and stayed there until now. I have oxen, donkeys, flocks, and male and female servants, and I have sent to tell my lord that I may find favor in your sight. Then the messengers returned to Jacob, saying, We came to your brother Esau, and he also is coming to meet you, and 400 men are with him. Wow. Again, Jacob's not sure how Esau is going to respond. So he's sending people ahead, go check it out. Go see how Esau feels about me coming back home. And they go to the land of Seir, that's where Esau was living, and it didn't look good in their mind. Here's Esau, he's coming to meet Jacob, and he's got 400 men with him. I don't think these guys talked with Esau. They saw this army, at least the army in their minds, and they hightailed it back to Jacob to warn him of the danger. Now, yeah, his servants are fearful, but not Jacob, right? Jacob is not going to be fearful. I mean, the Lord said to Jacob, Behold, I'm with you and will keep you wherever you go and will bring you back to this land, for I will not leave you until I have done what I have spoken. That was back in Genesis 28, verse 15. Now we have angels in the camp also. God's going to bring them back to Bethel. He's got these angels to protect them. So how's he going to respond to this news? Look at verse 7. So Jacob was great, greatly afraid, that's what it says, and distressed. And he divided the people that were with him and the flocks and herds and camels into two companies. And he said, if Esau comes to the one company and attacks it, then the other company which is left will escape. Wow. We're going to split it up. And if he attacks this group, well, they're dead meat this other group will get away. Well, wait a minute. God said he's going to bring you back in the land. You're, there's angels watching over you. Why are you so afraid? I think he's afraid because he knew how mad his brother Esau was. When his mother Rebekah sent him away, she warned him, you got to go, man. Your brother wants you dead. And she never, she said, I'm going to send word back to you when he chills out. She never did, and she dies before Jacob ever returns home. So Jacob doesn't know. Does this guy still want me dead? Now he's thinking, yeah. So Jacob, schemer, conniver, heel catcher, is coming up with a plan to protect himself. Divide the company or camp into two companies. Wow. Wasn't there already two companies in the camp? Oh, yeah. The family of Esau, I mean, family of Jacob, and the angels, right? There's already two companies there. Oh, now we're dividing it up again. Why? Because we don't trust the angels and we're not trusting God. Interesting. Look at verse 9. Then Jacob said, O God of my father Abraham and God of my father Isaac, the Lord who said to me, Return to your country and to your kindred, and I will deal well with you. I am not worthy of the least of all the mercies and of all the truth which you have shown your servant. For I crossed over this Jordan with my staff, and now I have become two companies. Deliver me, I pray, from the hand of my brother, from the hand of Esau, for I fear him, lest he come and attack me and the mother with children. For you said, I will surely treat you well and make your descendants as the sand of the sea, which can't, <coughs> which can't <coughs> be 
<coughs> numbered in multitude. You know, there is no mistake about it. He is fearful here. So what does he do? I think this is interesting. He prays. Isn't that a great thing? Is that something that comes to our mind when we're fearful? Is that one of the first things that comes to my mind, our minds when we are in fear or anxiety? No, it's probably not. We kind of think of ways to get out of it, like Jacob did at first. I'm going to do this. I'm going to do that. And it's like, man, this isn't going to work. I better pray. Well, and that's just what Jacob is doing here. You know, God wants us to bring our prayers to him. You know, Jacob stood upon God, the word of God, the Lord who said to me, return to your country and to your family, and I will deal well with you. You said that, Lord. We need to stand on God's word, his promises to us. He also sees his unworthiness before a holy and righteous God. He doesn't deserve anything from God. And yet, because of God's grace and mercy, he extends his love to Jacob and to us. And then he goes to his petition in verse 11 here of Genesis 32. Deliver me, I pray, from the hand of my brother, for the hand of Esau, for I fear him lest he come and attack me and the mother with children. You know, God wants to hear from us, to lay our requests at his feet. That's what Jacob is doing. And then he stands on God's promise. He said in ver again in verse 12, You said, I will surely treat you well and make your descendants as a sand of the sea, which cannot be numbered for multitude. Lord, if he kills me, it's a done deal. If he kills my family, that's how this is going to happen. I like that. You know, and if any of you know of George Miller, Mueller, excuse me, he was a great man of faith, um, great man of prayer. And someone asked him one day about his prayers. And the question was this. It was a great question. What was the most important part of your prayer? Did you ever think about that? What is the most important part of your prayer? And this is what he said. The 15 minutes after I've said amen. And what does that mean? Hey, I just made a prayer to God to deliver me. How am I going to respond in this situation here? It's one thing to say, okay, Lord, thank you. I know what your word says that you're going to deliver me out of this situation. And then leave the prayer room and come up with plans on how to get out of the situation. George Mueller knew. Can I really trust in the God that I've just been praying to? And he could. How does Jacob respond here after his prayer? Look at verse 13. So he lodged there that same night and took what came to his hand as a present for Esau's brother. 200 female goats and 20 male goats, 200 ewes and 20 rams, 30 milk camels with their colts, 40 cows and 10 bulls, 20 female donkeys and 10 foals. Then he delivered them to the hand of his servants, every drove by itself, and said to his servants, Pass over before me and put some distance between successive droves. And he commanded the first one, saying, When Esau, my brother, meets you and asks you, saying, To whom do you belong and where are you going? Who are these in front of you? Then you shall say, the, They are your servant Jacob's. It is a present sent to my lord Esau, and behold, he, is also, he also is behind us. So he commanded the second, the third, and all who followed the drove, saying, In this manner you shall speak to Esau when you find him. And also say, Behold, your servant Jacob is behind us. For he said, I will appease him with the present that goes before me, and afterward I will see his face. Perhaps he will accept me. So the present went over before him, but he himself lodged that night in the camp. Just in case prayer didn't work, here's another way I'm going to deal with it. I'm going to give them all these animals, right? And there were a lot of them. All these gifts. Five herds are going to be sent out with distance between them. And some 580 animals. Think, I mean, Jacob's traveling with a lot of animals, isn't he? He was really blessed working at his uncle Laban's. The thing is, did he have to send all those gifts to Esau? No. But he didn't trust God. 
In fact, if he did, he would have been in front, meeting he saw, face to face. You know, faith grows as we exercise it, as we put it into practice. And this is a carnal attempt by Jacob to save his life to buy in it by buying his brother Esau's favor. You know, remember the popular Christian song, All to Jesus I surrender, all to him I freely give. I will ever love and trust him in his presence daily live. I surrender all, I surrender all, all to thee, my blessed Savior, I surrender all. Jacob kind of changed the words to that song. I surrender all the goats, and if that's not enough, I surrender all the sheep. If that isn't enough, I'll surrender all the camels, and on and on and on. Who did he refuse to surrender to? Oh, the Lord. (laughs) The one he was praying to, right? The one who promised to protect him. You know, that's what we need to do is trust in the Lord. And for Jacob, we're going to see him wrestle with the Lord. And we're gonna, we'll look at that next time because I, won't, I don't want to rush through that section because it's a really important section. Because in that section, God is going to change Jacob's name from heel catcher, conniver, schemer to Israel or governed by God. And as you're reading through Genesis, when he's called Jacob, He's a man of the flesh. It's very interesting. When he's called Israel, he's walking in the spirit. Keep an eye on that as we go through the rest of Genesis. So we'll pick up next time here, beginning in verse 22 of Genesis chapter 32. But let me share a few things first, and then I'll close, that deal with surrender. Because surrender is the hardest thing to do, isn't it? You know, people don't want to surrender to anyone. And not even the Lord. In Jeremiah 10, verses 23 and 24, we're told, O Lord, I know the way of man is not in himself. It is not in man who walks to direct his own steps. O Lord, correct me, but with justice. Not in your anger, lest you bring me to nothing. We need the Lord to direct our steps. It's so difficult. But he is the one who lights our path, right? He guides us. And if we're on our own, we're headed for disaster. Psalm 50, verse 15, Call upon me in the day of trouble, I will deliver you, and you shall glorify me. That means we need to surrender to him. Lord, I I have nothing else. I'm coming to you. And lastly, in Matthew 26, 39, Jesus is in the Garden of Gethsemane before he's arrested and crucified. And listen to what he's saying. He went a little farther and fell on his face and prayed, saying, O my Father, If it is possible, let this cup pass from me. Nevertheless, not as I will, but as you will. Ah, That's complete surrender, isn't it? You know, honestly, I don't want my will to be done because I always mess up. And that's why when I pray, I go, Lord, you know, if these prayers are off base, your will be done in this matter. You know what needs to be done. I don't always understand. But Lord, the more I spend time with you, the more I understand what your will is for my life. And there's the key. Spend time in his word, spend time in prayer, spend time in fellowship with him, and you will see God direct your life the way it really needs to go. You will be Israel, in a sense, governed by God. And we just walk by faith. It's not always easy, but boy, it's the best place to be. Let's pray. Father, we thank you uh, for your word this evening. And Lord, you just tell it like it is. You, this is just humanity, Lord. Uh, man, man's heart is wicked, it's deceitful, and that's why we need you, Lord. We need you to cleanse us of our sins. And you, you do that as we repent and ask you to be Lord and Savior of our lives. You, you cleanse us of all our sins. We're as white as snow in a positional sense, in a practical sense, we still got to deal with those issues every day of our lives. But help us, Lord. Help us to grow in you. Help us to place our life on the altar of sacrifice and said, Lord, here's my life. It's for you, Lord. Direct it, guide it, use it as you will. And Lord, conform my heart, conform my will to your will. 
thank you, Lord. And we just ask these things in Jesus' name. Amen.